Okay. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Veli Matova. Veli is a professor of philosophy and head of the philosophy department at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. She is a co-founder of the African Center of Philosophy of Science, of Epistemology and Philosophy of Science at the University of, University of Johannesburg, where she heads up the Epistemic Injustice Project. She's also the South African team leader for an exciting and important global project called the Geography of Philosophy Project. Veli's research is at the intersection of epistemology, metaethics, and the philosophy of action. She is the editor of Epistemic Decolonization, which is a special issue in the philosophical papers published in 2020. She's also the, the editor of The Facts of Turn in Epistemology, which was published in 2018. The editor of that. Um, she's an author of the book, Believable Evidence, and that was published in 2017. Her research at the moment is on what we'll be talking about today, epistemic injustice and the decolonization of knowledge. She regularly collaborates with researchers from around the world on several projects related to her research. Just last year, um, just papers related to, in part, her talk today, she published or a paper that's going to be coming out this year is a paper called How to Decolonize Knowledge Without Too Much Relativism, and that will be in a volume called The South African Epistemic Decolonial Turn, Decolonial Turn, A Global Perspective. Bailey's interest in epistemic decolonization is not just related to her research, but also to her teaching, her supervision of students, and her heading of the philosophy department at UJ. Briefly, Bailey's honors and master's courses, which were called The Ethics of Race and Transformation, and uh, a course called Epistemic Injustice have explored and advanced various themes of epistemic decolonization. These, the topics of these courses, for example, are themselves crucial for philosophically engaging with the issue of decolonizing knowledge. Betty supervises and funds through her grants postgrad students who interrogate the question of epistemic decolonization. And in her term as HOD, Betty has been at the forefront of implementing concrete changes in the department directed at decol uh, decolonizing the department. This includes, for example, amendments to the prescribed readings um, that also center African thought in addition to other perspectives in philosophy, reworking the manner and form of assessment uh, in the department, the promotion of the use of indigenous African languages in the philosophy classroom at UJ, and also a serious engagement with staff and students of philosophy at UJ on what decolonization is and what decolonization and transformation might look like in the department on the ground. So she's quite well primed to talk to us today about epistemic decolonization, what, why, and how. So here is our speaker, Bailey Matilda. Thank you very much, Zintle, uh, for your kind introduction. Um, and, and thank you uh, to the crew or squad uh, who actually thought of, of, of organizing these series. It's really amazing to me that um, I'm talking on this topic in the UK. Uh, so thank you guys, Azita and Dominique um, and Catherine and Zintle for organizing these. Um, so what I want to do today um, is, is introduce uh, three axes of thinking about decolonizing knowledge, in, particularly, uh, in particular in the South African context. Um, and let me stress, I really want to introduce them only. So this is not gonna be some kind of hectic um, uh, philosophical talk, uh, and it's certainly not going to be exhaustive, uh, and it's not going to cover any of the uh, South American literature, which is actually uh, the original literature uh, uh, on this topic. So as you might uh, guess from my title, the, top, the, the, the three axes are what decolonization is, uh, why we should uh, decolonize knowledge, uh, how we should do so. And, and let me just be quite clear that this one question that I will not discuss, uh, and this is whether we should, so uh, decolonize. As, as you can see, that ship uh, has already sailed. So what is uh, epistemic decolonization? I think that that's to, to get what, what it is, uh, uh, we need to, to think about uh, the, the topic on the background of, of what the mechanism, uh, mechanisms of epistemic colonization uh, were. And I find uh, Kwasi Weredu's uh, uh, very helpful um, uh, triple kind of uh, 
origin kind of diagnosis of, of, of the mechanisms, um, he says that epistemic colonialism happened through language, religion, and politics. So um, language, of course, because uh, every language goes with the conceptual framework. And so if you impose your language on me, then you're imposing, imposing your way of thinking um, on me. Um, religion, we all know about the civilizing mission. Uh, so the idea that there are these heathen souls in need of saving and civilizing uh, and politics, well, you know, I assume I don't, I don't need to uh, spell that one out. Now, um, some people live in a, in a happy world in which they think that, that we're actually in a post-colonial society. Uh, and that's far from, from, from the case. Uh, we're very much still in, in the uh, epistemic uh, colonial era. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see these because of the, the pictures, uh, but, but basically we're still very much uh, uh, in a world in which uh, colonialism is enforced through language. Uh, so some people uh, are expected to always communicate in, in not in their first language, but in the second one. So they're always at a disadvantage. Uh, through our education system, through uh, economic discrep discrepancies in, in power, um, and uh, through uh, still prevalent institutional culture of racism. So I'm not sure if, if uh, certainly the UK people remember uh, in, at the end of 2019, uh, when two women received the, the Booker Prize uh, and uh, it was referred to as Margaret Atwood and another author sharing uh, the Booker Prize. Uh, so here's what uh, the other author, Bernadine Evaristo, said uh, about the issue. Um, well, she said, how quickly and casually, uh, I can't read this, sorry, because my screens are here. Let me just close them, apologies. Uh, how quickly and casually they have removed my name from history, the first black woman to win it. This is what we've always been up against, folks. Uh, so colonialism is very much uh, alive and well, and certainly its epistemic version is very prevalent, uh, both in South Africa and worldwide. So, okay, so what is, uh, against this background, what is epistemic decolonization? Well, um, it's, it is, of course, a, a philosophical issue what it is, but, but I find helpful six features uh, as kind of core features on, on which all we can agree. Um, and and they're, they're articulated very nicely by Sabel and Lovo uh, in his recent book on epistemic freedom. So the first feature is uh, intellectual freedom from the colonizer. So he puts it like this. Um, Epistemic uh, decolonization speaks to cognitive justice. It is fundamentally about the right to think, theorize, interpret the world, develop our own methodologies, and write from where one is located and unencumbered by Eurocentrism. Second feature, which is quite closely related, uh, is what I would like to call intellectual legitimation. And so in the African context, and remember, I'm only talking about the African slash South African context, uh, this is an intellectual and academic process of centering Africa as a legitimate historical unit of analysis an epistemic site from which to interpret the world, while at the same time globalizing knowledge from Africa. So the idea here is that instead of uh, being an anthropological subject, um, Africa is a source of knowledge uh, and, and, and something that the rest of the world uh, can, can learn from. The third feature uh, of epistemic decolonization is uh, what we could call knowledge legitimation. And, and this involves the move away from thinking about knowledge in the singular uh, to thinking about it in the plural. So the move from knowledge to knowledges. Uh, so the, the idea that we should recognize various uh, knowledge systems as legitimate. The fourth feature, uh, I, I call no more civilizing. Um, and Ndlovo uh says it's, it's basically the idea that we need to, need to demythologize the idea of Europe as a teacher and Africa as a pupil. Fifth feature, no more race hierarchies. Uh, since part of the epistemic injustice of colonization 
is entangled with social power and race, uh, then epistemic decolonization requires us to correct uh, the distorted human relationships that emerged from the social classification uh, of human species and their racial hierarchization. And final feature, and something that, that gets quite often omitted from these discussions, that, that epistemic decolonization is basic to political and economic transformation. So we can tell ourselves all sorts of stories uh, about a transformed society, a, a transformed education system, but the fact of the matter is that until we decolonize uh, epistemically, uh, none of this is going to, to be a proper sense of transformation. So these then are, uh, are the, the six core features uh, that, I, that I, I, I think epistemic decolonization, any decent notion of epistemic decolonization uh, should have. Why should we? Uh, decolonize. Remembering that I'm taking for granted that we should uh, uh, epistemically decolonize. We're not going to discuss uh, whether we should, uh, but there are various rationales uh, in the literature that one might want to consider for, for decolonization. Um, and again, they're quite closely related to each other, but, but I think that they're fairly distinguishable. So there's an epistemic one, uh, a conceptual one, and a moral one. And let me start with the epistemic one. Uh, I should say that, that I find it probably the least plausible, uh, but, and I'll tell you why. So the epistemic rationale um, starts with the idea that, that colonialism has committed epistemicide um, by giving itself sole authority to say what counts as knowledge, rationality, and so on, and silencing other epistemic perspectives and knowledge systems uh, is non-knowledge. So I think we're all familiar with the phenomenon where some of us uh, are rational, whereas others are emotional, especially when we say no, uh, irrational, mystical, and just generally in need of cognitive upgrading and civilizing. Um, similarly, that same perspective says what counts as science and non-science, so this is uh, not science, uh, and uh, this is science presumably because it involves a sharp instrument. Uh, and closer to home in the philosophical context, uh, it, gets to say, uh, it gets to say who counts as a proper philosopher and who doesn't. So this guy over here is supposed to be a psychologist and anthropologist, whereas this crazy guy over here with, uh, with whatever this is, banjo or whatever, is a proper philosopher. And whatever questions he asks are properly philosophical, whereas questions about race uh, and so on are not. So of course this is all uh, a, stereo a stereotype, but but I'm just trying to uh, to drive the point home. Uh, so colonialism has committed epistemicide. Uh, the the epistemic rationale goes, and so decolonizing knowledge requires at a very minimum that we need to give different uh, epistemic perspectives equal epistemic authority. Uh, what do we mean by this? We mean basically that that each of these perspectives is going to be restored an equal claim to constituting genuine knowledge. So here's an author in the, in the context of, of uh, the decolonization of, of the South African curriculum, uh, who says, in advocating for the reversal of epistemicide, excuse me, we necessarily seek to place indigenous knowledge systems of the concrete peoples of South Africa on the same level of parity with other epistemological paradigms in order to achieve uh, both formal and substantive equality. So this is an example of someone endorsing this rationale. Now I said that um, I don't find this rationale particularly plausible. Uh, and I think it's because it's, it's profoundly relativistic. Um, uh, although there are ways of spelling it out without relativism, but certainly the way I have spelled it out here is relativistic. Um, and um, I know that uh, there are a couple of respectable relativists in the audience, uh, but let's let's uh, just say that relativism faces familiar problems. Uh, and one of them is that equal epistemic authority is a very dubious basis for, for running a successful, uh, a successful scientific enterprise. Uh, so for example, um, if you have incommensurable concepts of illness, uh, which the, the South and the North do, 
uh, then you're not going to get very far with this kind of uh, uh, apportioning equal epistemic authority uh, to, to your medical experts. So let me tell you what I mean. Um, the Yoruba, for example, and actually many African cultures have an extremely holistic uh, notion of health and illness, which includes both uh, social relationships, your divine relationships, as well as various physical uh, phenomena. So then if you have uh, the Southern concept of illness and the Northern concept of illness, uh, you'll get situations in which, in which uh, these two statements, uh, there won't be a fact of the matter if relativism is right, who is, who is correct between us, right? So if I say that Bob is ill and I'm using the Northern concept um, of illness, and you say that Bob is not ill and you're using the Southern concept of illness, relativism would say that there's no fact of the matter who's right, which presumably uh, is not a great uh, basis for medical diagnosis. Now, I've become suspicious of this rationale, of this, sorry, of this problem, because Zintle has been trying to persuade me, uh, Zintle, our kind chair, uh, has been trying to persuade me for years that uh, this is way too simplistic, uh, because if you get more sophisticated about your health concepts, you can avoid incommensurability. Um, and she's been trying to generally persuade me that uh, I'm exaggerating the incommensurability between North and South uh, in, certain, in certain instances. So perhaps uh, that is not uh, a problem that relativism needs to face in this context. But I think that the, the problem that, that it does face is that it can't really justify uh, epistemic decolonization uh, and for the simple reason that if the, the imperative to decolonize is absolute. Uh, so the wrongs of colonialism are absolute. Uh, they're not, well, it's, it's evil according to my culture and it's a fine idea according to your culture. Um, we know that according to some cultures, it's a fine idea, uh, but, but we want precisely the tools to be able to say that this is absolutely wrong. And if the wrongs of colonialism uh, are absolute, then so is the imperative to redress these, these uh, wrongs. And so relativism can justify an absolute imperative. So I think that this is why uh, this, this, uh, this rationale is quite, quite weak. But there are two much stronger rationales uh, for epistemic decolonization. And the first one, uh, is, is due to Kwasi Uredu and Ngugi Wationgo. Uh, I'll just focus on, on Kwasi Uredu because I have a preference for philosophers. Uh, uh, and his, uh, his target is to show that conceptual um, or linguistic decolonization uh, is essential to epistemic decolonization. Um, what does he mean by conceptual uh, decolonization? He takes this to have a, a negative program uh, and a positive program. And the negative one is the elimination from our thought of modes of conceptualization that came to us through colonization, sorry, through colonization and remain in our thinking owing to inertia rather than to our own reflective choices. Uh, whereas the positive program is exploiting as much as it judicious the resources of our own indigenous conceptual schemes. So that's how he conceives of, of conceptual decolonization. And, and then the rationale for, for epistemic decolonization that stems from, from, from this conceptual uh, decolonization goes something, well, it doesn't go something like this. This is a direct quote from him. Um, he says, languages carry their own kind of philosophical suggestiveness which foreign as well as native speakers are apt to take for granted. If by virtue of a colonial history, you trained right from the beginning in a foreign language and initiated thereby into the, the professing of philosophy, then certain basic ways of thought that seem natural to native speakers might become natural to you. Consequently, you might not even realize that those ways of thinking may not be all that natural. Or if your own language is radically different, even coherent from the stand, standpoint of your own language. Um, and Kwasi Uredo has made a career of showing uh, what, what, uh, what peculiarities and philosophical awkwardness we get into 
uh, if we ignore that that moral. So uh, he has explored various um, Akan concepts, really amazingly actually. Like, so I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, uh, just, just the, the epistemic concepts, truth, fact, opinion, belief, knowledge, faith, doubt, certainty, statement, proposition, sentence, idea. So basically I challenge you to, to, uh, uh, to, to find one, you know, what is missing here? So these are all the uh, basic epistemological concepts. Uh, and he says that they're basically extremely different in Akan. So much so that certain questions um, that we in analytic and anglophone epistemology take for granted completely don't make sense. Um, so perhaps this is uh, despite Zintler's objection to incommensurability, this does show that there's some, some sense to be made of uh, incommensurable uh, paradigms between uh, between cultural frameworks, Conce sorry, conceptual frameworks. So uh, he says, uh, Quasi Redu says, well, then the main antidote for that is for African philosophers to try to think philosophically in their own vernaculars, even if they still have to expound their results in some Western language afterwards. So I take it that this rationale, just to to um, to make it a little bit uh, a bit more succinct, is it goes something like this. So which language you speak partly determines how you think, um, and which problems you find important and significant. Uh, being trained in a colonial language means that you're absorbing a colonial framework, uh, and thereby uh, certain theoretical interests. And some of this framework and interest just don't make sense from the point of view of your own language. Um, and so epistemic decolonization requires researching, thinking uh, uh, within your discipline in your own language. So that is the, the conceptual rationale uh, for decolonization, for epistemic decolonization. Um, the third rationale available in the literature is, is the moral one. Uh, and it's basically saying that epistemic decolonization uh, is a moral imperative. Um, well, why? Because colonialism, and this, this comes quite close to the, to the epistemic rationale, but, but, it's, but it's different as we'll see. Um, the reason is that colonialism has inflicted epistemic injustices uh, that need to be redressed. Uh, what are those? To use the language of, of uh, social epistemology and Miranda Fricker in particular, uh, it's the idea that uh, colonialism has wronged people in their capacity as knowers, as producers of knowledge, as conveyors of knowledge, uh, and so on. Now, you can take this with a pinch of salt. Um, the epistemic injustice concept is a problematic one. It was only um, about a month ago when uh, Lewis Gordon was giving a talk at the University of Johannesburg, uh, we had a fight on this topic because he thinks that uh, the notion of epistemic injustice is a white woman notion and it's kind of um, uh, appropriated actually from far more sophisticated black feminist resources. Um, point well taken, uh, call this whatever whatever you like, that, that bit where the yellow line is. Uh, I'm not particularly uh, sold on, on this way of cashing it out, as long as it's understood that some form of injustice, uh, which has a, a distinctively epistemic dimension, has been inflicted um, through colon by colonialism, uh, and that this needs to be addressed. So that's all we need for the moral rationale uh, to go through. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the people who, who think uh, uh, who, who push this rationale, such as my colleague from Witz, uh, Edwin Etiebo, uh, do find the notion helpful, the way Fricker spells it. So, so let me just focus on that. But again, you can just fill in uh, uh, the notion with whatever you, whatever you prefer and doesn't, doesn't uh, annoy you uh, with white, white woman stuff. So, okay, so the one liner uh, that uh, Etiebo argues for is that, um, and this is in the context of, of, the, uh, of, of education and curriculum, is that Africanizing the curriculum in universities in Africa is a moral imperative on both the Kantian uh, and the utilitarian uh, paradigm. So by Africanizing the curriculum, he, he means uh, intuitively enough, uh, the appropriation, adoption and incorporation, incorporation into the curriculum uh, of the experiences, practices, beliefs, values 
and ways of, li ways of life of Sub-Saharan Africans. Um, and he, he takes this to, to have two, uh, two uh, modes or two, two varieties. One is a radical kind of appropriation uh, and the other one is a moderate one. So on the radical uh, idea of Africanizing the curriculum, uh, we would just basically throw out uh, every, every Western uh, influence and, uh, and uh, uh, content from our curriculum and modes of, modes of teaching. Uh, whereas on the moderate view, uh, we, would, we would have more of a, an amalgam of, uh, of all sorts of uh, traditions. And, and he defends the moderate view. So he thinks that the moderate uh, Africanization of the curriculum is a moral imperative on both the Kantian and the utilitarian uh, views. So how does he do that? Um, well, on each model, he argues, not Africanizing uh, the curriculum actually wrongs Africans. Um, and the moral wrong in the Kantian view is to do with, with issues of autonomy. So he takes the, so he takes the crucial Kantian notion to be uh, uh, one, the, the one of autonomy, uh, and then argues that promoting or respecting people's autonomy involves not depriving them of the conceptual resources to make sense of their world. Um, and I mean, I, I think that's it's it's fairly obvious, but let me spell it out. So autonomous choice uh, is is choice in accordance with what the agent takes to be a rational representation of the world. And so he says, but such representation requires that one is in a position uh, to access the resources essential for meaning making. Um, so so not teaching uh, African thought deprives Africans of conceptual resources precisely such conceptual resources of meaning making. Um, and he gives the example of Ubuntu, uh, which, is, which is essential to both uh, African ethics and, and metaphysics because, because it forms part of, uh, of many notions of personhood. And this is the idea that you're a person through other people. Um, and so if you, if, you, if you deprive African students of this concept, then you're basically not allowing them to understand their world in a way that they're supposed to be uh, understanding it. Uh, you, you're cutting out a portion of, of metaphysics for them and of ethics that they should be they should be uh, uh, should have access to. Um, and the fancy label for that label for that uh, again from from Miranda Fricker is is hermeneutical injustice. When you sorry not for Ubuntu but for when you deprive someone of the resources uh, to make sense of, the, of, of their world. Um, so uh, Etiebo concludes, not teaching African thought is a failure to promote uh, or respect Africans' autonomy. And that's the sense in which uh, not Africanizing the curriculum wrongs Africans. Um, similarly, on, on the utilitarian view, um, he argues a non-decolonized curriculum commits testimonial injustice against Africans. So um, again, to use uh, Fricker's uh, labels, this is credibility defi deficit due to identity prejudice. So for example, when I, when I ignore your testimony because you're, you're black or you're a woman. Um, and then the idea is that when you're not teaching African thought, you're kind of uh, uh, committing testimonial injustice uh, to expert testimony on certain topics. Um, but uh, testimonial injustice, he argues, undermines the maximization of utility, which is the highest uh, good on the utilitarian view. And, and, he, and it does so by impoverishing African culture and thought, which presumably, if it's taught at university level, would get, would, would get richer and richer. Um, it deprives Africa of the opportunity to contribute to the world's knowledge production. So if you remember, one of the features of epistemic decolonization was the idea that, that Africa's knowledge needs to be globalized. So that Africa is not just a, an anthropological uh, object, but is also a source of knowledge. Um, and finally, it impoverishes philosophy uh, in particular uh, because, because Africans, African perspectives uh, would, would enrich it. So, so he concludes uh, a non-decolonized curriculum wrongs Africans by failing to maximize utility. 
So, so these are the three rationales. Uh, the, the epistemic rationale, which I, which I argued was relativist uh, and therefore implausible. Uh, the conceptual rationale uh, on which we need to decolonize language uh, and, and the language of instruction, certainly at universities. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the moral rationale, which has to do with considerations of justice. So how, uh, so here's the million dollar question, right? So you know, you know, that there's plenty theorizing, how should we uh, decolonize knowledge? Um, and if you're looking for a million do dollar answer, you're not going to get it. Uh, but, but let me at least model something, something on, on Wiredo's conception of, of linguistic or conceptual decolonization. So this is gonna be a scheme uh, and then, and then I'll, I'll get a little bit meatier uh, uh, after I've introduced it. So, so if you remember, Wiredo's uh, uh, conceptual decolonization involved two programs, a negative program uh, and a positive program. Um, and if we're going to model uh, epistemic decolonization on that, uh, uh, let me rephrase. So the negative program is going to consist in the elimination of epistemic practices, in other words, ways of generating uh, and passing knowledge that came to us through colonization and remain owing to inertia rather than to our own reflective choices. Uh, note this is quite, quite a moderate conception uh, as I phrased it. Uh, because we could just stop uh, at the the second red bit and we can say that came to us through colonization, uh, full stop. Um, uh, but this is this is where uh, uh conception of the negative program uh, in any case. Um, and then the positive program would involve the exploitation of, of uh, again, the moderate bit here, as much as judicious, the resources of our own indigenous knowledge systems and epistemic practices. So again, this is just a, a, a scheme, a husk, uh, in which we would need to plug in a whole lot of uh, ideas of what this means, elimination of epistemic practices, uh, exploitation of resources, and so on. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on the negative program, uh, this being the, the easy one, I think. So, and, and again, let me, let me just focus on academia. I have been kind of uh, silently doing so anyway, but, but let me make that explicit. Uh, so, so let's just talk about uh, how we can decolonize uh, knowledge in the, in, in the academic or how we can decolonize academia. And the various views that fall on a spectrum uh, um, and we can, I mean, so on, on the one end of the spectrum, uh, there'll be a kind of band-aid approach uh, which it's not even on the spectrum of decolonization, hence I haven't put it really on the spectrum. Uh, and, and then on the other extreme, it would be uh, completely getting rid of, of all Western influences, Western canon in, the, um, in, this, in, in our curriculum and so on. Um, and, and in the middle, there'll be something like, for lack of a better word, uh, knowledge diversity, where we, where we uh, draw on, on all traditions uh, available to humanity, and so this is the this is the spectrum uh, uh, along which one can think of decolonizing of how to decolonize uh, knowledge, and we can do so uh, at least along six dimensions, six aspects of, of academia, uh, five of which I'm, bo I'm borrowing from uh, from Thaddeus Metz, uh, the curriculum, our research our language, the language of instruction uh, and research, the aesthetics uh, of academia, governance and cultural practices. Um, and we can have for each of these, uh, we can have various, variously uh, moderate to radical conceptions. So we can have, we can think that the curriculum can, can uh, just be a Western curriculum, obviously not on the, that's not on the spectrum of epistemic decolonization, uh, through to knowledge diversity, uh, to uh, completely uh, no Western content. Uh, and likewise with all of the other dimensions. So governance, we can uh, have a, a, a anything from diverse kind of um, governing body to uh, entirely non-Western uh, uh, influenced body. 
And I want to focus on, on these three aspects, the curriculum, uh, aesthetics, and cultural practices. So the curriculum, uh, the Band-Aid approach is, uh, would be something like, and in South Africa, a lot of previously white universities are familiar with this approach and tried it for years. So it's, it's basically, you introduce a few African authors uh, and, then, and then you're like, okay, we've done our job and we get our grants and, and that's fine. Uh, and that's obviously no good. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's possibly even worse than, than not doing anything at all uh, because it kind of creates the impression that, that you're doing something and so it keeps everyone happy uh, uh, and, and nothing actually happens, substantively speaking. Uh, so that's why I've, I've left this uh, out of, of the spectrum of genuine epistemic decolonization. Uh, knowledge diversity uh, is, is, is the more uh, uh, usual approach uh, and probably favored at the moment. Uh, and that is, again, to, to restore kind of uh, equal epistemic authority to different knowledge systems. Um, and let me mention some challenges. Uh, the first one, perhaps it, it's relativist, but, but probably not, because uh, if we just mean that we're teaching various traditions, uh, we're not making a, a genuine claim to, okay, and now we have these incommensurate truth claims. So I don't think that relativism uh, is, a, is a genuine problem here. Uh, but I think that knowledge diversity might not be enough. Uh, for a genuine uh, conception of decolonization. Um, it's, it's a kind of uh, invitation to sit at our table with the attendant adhering and, and uh, retaining for certain people always the status of guest, I think. So when, so when the institution is already established in this way, uh, inviting people to sit at your table is, is uh, a bad idea actually, because uh, actually we need to like change the table altogether. So that's so that's that's some some worries about uh, knowledge diversity. And the the most radical view uh, concerning the the curriculum uh, would be to um, teach only original decolonial content. Uh, and again, it's not without challenges because there's such entanglement between. Uh, for example, African thought in the Anglophone world and analytic philosophy thought. Uh, and, and because it's, it's all done in, in, in English, uh, there's, there's also an entanglement with the conceptual frameworks and so on of, of colonialism. Uh, and I know that uh, Zintli mentioned the Geography of Philosophy project, but some, some colleagues in, in Peru, for example, who, who are doing research, uh, they, they had to go in the middle of, of the Amazon jungle, like literally, to find uh, Quechua speakers who don't speak Spanish as well. So, so, so uh, it, might be, uh, it might be seen as a challenge for this completely out with the West uh, uh, approach, whether it's, it's really possible to be completely out, out with the West at, at this stage. Um, and then one might think that, that we, we could lose potentially uh, useful tools if we, if we just get rid of everything. So, so, so much for the, for the curriculum. Um, let me just have a look. Okay. Um, the aesthetics um, uh, aspect, and it's not talked about very often. This is my university. Um, and those of you who, who uh, love brutalism or probably have never seen anything this beautiful. Those of you who know South African history uh, will know that uh, it was actually, uh, it's, it looks remarkably like uh, these things that the Boers used to uh, invade the, uh, the African land with. So they used to uh, range the, the ox wagons in a circle, precisely uh, like my university, except the closed one, and put their families in the middle. So, so you can imagine that for uh, uh, an African student, this, this building is not uh, exactly uh, the most consoling one, even though uh, it's meant to be an, an open lager, it's meant to be modeled on an open lager. So you might think, okay, well, weird university, you know, uh, maybe the other ones are fine, uh, but uh, not so. So here's uh, the university four kilometers down from UJ, uh, the University of Witwatersrand, also dreaming European thoughts. Uh, and here's, it's not even a provincial matter, it's, um, sorry, uh, here's the University of Cape Town, uh, 
thinking even older European thoughts. So um, a, a little bit of an awkward setup for universities in Africa. And you might think, okay, just being really sensitive is just buildings. And of course, it's not just buildings. Uh, it's, it's where future knowledge producers uh, get trained. Um, and certain buildings, and I should say that this is Oxford, not, not Cambridge, because there seems to be a preponderance of Cambridge people on the, on the organizing committee. Uh, but certain aesthetics uh, just keep suggesting that this is for Europeans only, this space. Uh, and of course, they, they just perpetuate um, systematically unjust patterns of value. Uh, so it's not just buildings. And, and finally, let me say a word on cultural practices. Uh, uh, and that's not something that I've heard anyone uh, talk about uh, in the philosophical uh, discourse on, on uh, epistemic decolonization. Uh, and I'll just draw attention to a couple of uh, features. Uh, uh, one of them is the white tyranny of tea time. That, that's my label. Um, but um, it's quite interesting to, to read accounts of what uh, 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 someone who's not used to, to these practices, what, what they, they feel like. So here's a, an Indian colleague going to a previously white university in South Africa. And here's his comments on this, uh, uh, on this practice of tea time, having a tea break. Uh, I understood that tea time was a chance to relax, to be collegial that in a very real sense, it was a university established practice designed to encourage hospitality. Why was it then that I felt so ill at ease, so very unwelcomed, precisely during a period in the day created to make me feel at home? It's premised quite obviously on the notion that one likes tea or coffee or cigarettes. And when I stood amongst my colleagues without these physical objects, I felt less like I belong there. And the informality of the gathering only strengthened my sense that there was, here was a community at ease with itself. And I quickly realized that it was my job to become more like them. And, and, and so, so it goes. Uh, uh, no matter what you do, they remain they, and I remain the outsider. Um, so the, I mean, these are, these are practices that are ingrained in, in, uh, in the university and, and there are others, but I, I don't want Dominique to kill me because I, I overdo my, I overstay my welcome, but eating uh, is another one. Uh, looking into people's eyes uh, is uh, a sign of uh, disrespect in African cultures, for example, uh, and so on. And these are all, again, okay, what, what does that have to do with, with epistemic decolonization? Well, they just keep enforcing the idea that the European way is the sole way, uh, and hence the idea that, that the European is the, the, the one in, in charge epistemically uh, as well as otherwise. So decolonizing academia must involve uh, de-hegemonizing institutional culture and these, these cultural practices as well. Um, now you might worry uh, that, that this conception of epistemic decolonization is still too centered on the West. So uh, it's suggesting that the marginalized should be always defining themselves uh, negatively in relation to the, to the oppressor. Uh, and obviously that, that, that would risk undermining the whole decolonial project. Uh, and someone uh, like Bernard Mutolino, for example, from the University of Kuzulu Natal worries along these lines. In fact, he rejects, he thinks that, that talking about epistemic decolonization because of this uh, is, is, is a fruitless, or it's, it's been over, over rated. Um, but recall that uh, according to my current, uh, at least spelling out of epistemic decolonization, uh, the notion has a negative program. I mean, it seems that it should have a negative program. So it, it, it seems that we need to get rid of a whole lot of stuff uh, as, as part of the decolonial project. Um, so then I guess that the challenge would become how to do so without uh, letting uh, the West and Western conceptions still dominate our theorizing uh, of epistemic decolonization. And I won't uh, go through this with you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Vedi, for your presentation.